Good morning, everyone. My name is Jose Lozano, and I'm the president and CEO of Choose New Jersey. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, Choose New Jersey is a not-for-profit organization responsible for business development and attraction for the state of New Jersey, and it does a lot of the marketing that attracts companies and trying to make New Jersey a good home. As we celebrate our 10th anniversary of the organization, I start to look back at some of the great strategies and the partnerships and developments that we have created over time. And I got to say that one of the strongest ones that we've created and one of the strongest ones that we continue to invest significant time in is our relationship uh, with the state of Israel. The significant amount of individuals, <coughs> excuse me, and companies that call New Jersey home and have Israel as their original home is quite significant. Um, we actually, it's amazing to think that just three months ago, a delegation and I, we were all in Israel just before the, the sense of the COVID, continuing to invest in the relationship that we have. And we know that the ties between our two states is significantly great. Our, our populations are almost exactly the same at 9 million. We have a significant, uh, uh, we, we have, uh, we're in a metropolis between two metropolitan areas, but we know that our, it's in our DNA, innovation and creativity and, to solution and, and solutions to challenges is in our DNA, is just as much as state of Israel. And so for today, I am thrilled that we have so many great folks that are gonna be presenting. And we are thrilled that, that you all have taken the time to join us here. So we have a start, uh, start setting a, 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 a agenda for it with folks today. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off. Uh, and we know that at the very end, Mark Levinson, who uh, serves and has many, many hats, but one of which is the chairman of the Israel Commission will moderate a discussion. If you go at the very bottom of your screen and you are able to uh, type in your questions, Mark will then uh, facilitate that question with the panelists and so forth. So uh, I, I know we're a little, uh, time for crunch and the schedule is pretty tight. So I'm gonna go ahead and see my time and we're gonna go ahead and kick it off to the very first person, uh, to the, uh, the, the great mayor of the city of Jerusalem. Okay, you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and Actually, it's, it's the Deputy Mayor, she will join us. Uh, Ms. Fleur Hassan, are you here? Oh, Deputy Mayor, I apologize. I don't. Jose, why don't, why don't we continue with the schedule? Let's see if we can get her on the, uh, on the line. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll go ahead and go on to the next individual who is uh, my friend and colleague, Debbie Hart, who's the CEO of BioNJ. Great, thanks so much, Jose, and good morning, everyone. Thanks to Jose and Choose New Jersey and all of our partners who are joining us today. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all um, from BioNJ, and I hope that you're all safe and well in this difficult time. So it's my honor to introduce our keynote right now. And there's, I think, no more perfect person to launch this discussion than this person. He has built bridges from Israel to New Jersey. He's forging relationships, companies, investments, and entrepreneurs from Jersey to Jerusalem. He chairs Teva, a very large Israeli-based company with a very large footprint in New Jersey. He's the founder and leader of Celgene, a legendary New Jersey biotech company. Today, he's furthering and building those bridges and making them even stronger between our geographies and our organizations in the age of COVID-19. So it's my honor to introduce an inspired leader, an accomplished entrepreneur, a generous philanthropist, former chair of BioNJ, and best of all, my friend, Dr. Saul J. Bearer. Saul, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, Deputy Mayor Fleur Hassan Nahum, Ambassador Donny Dayan, fellow speakers, and thank you to, new, uh, to Choose New Jersey, Jose Lozano, and Mark Levinson and Andrew Gross, Gross of the Commission, New Jersey Israel Commission. So the topic we're discussing today is one in which I'm personally deeply involved in. As Debbie indicated, I chair the largest generic pharmaceutical company in the world, which also happens to be the largest company in Israel. And I was also a founder and ran Celgene, one of the world's largest R&D-based biotech companies. 
So I've been involved in both developing cutting edge new drugs all the way through to serving the global public health. Every day, by the way, almost 200 million people around the world take a Teva medicine. Both companies, Celgene and Teva, have a common critical role in healthcare, and they also have New Jersey in common. Celgene's global headquarters was in New Jersey, and Teva's North American headquarters, serving its largest market, is also in New Jersey. Among other New Jersey efforts, I'm founding chair of a major New, J New Jersey medical institute, the Hackensack Meridian Center for, Discovery, for Drug Discovery and Innovation that's well known for COVID research. And indeed, it was highlighted last night with a story on 60 Minutes. It is particularly gratifying to be at a symposium that highlights Jerusalem, an important healthcare hub for Israel, where many advances are being made in great numbers of therapeutic areas. And to further emphasize the link between Jerusalem, Teva, and New Jersey, Teva started as an Israeli company 120 years ago in Jerusalem, right outside the Jaffa Gate. So the first question, so why New Jersey for biotech and pharma? New Jersey has been called the medicine chest of the world, as most major pharmaceutical companies have a major <laughs> presence in the state. In addition, we are a major biotechnology hub with hundreds of entrepreneurial, productive, and exciting biotech companies. Innumerable, innumerable medical breakthroughs and innovations have come from the state. Indeed, there are few places in the world to match the intensity of the biopharma culture. Furthermore, New Jersey boasts a well-educated workforce with a very high concentration of scientific professionals, world-class research institutions, including 13 teaching hospitals and four medical schools. From a financial perspective, we also have easy access and strong ties to New York, the financial capital of the world. New Jersey is also known for numerous favorable governmental incentive programs, which I'm sure you'll hear about, including the state's R&D tax, tax credit, uh, which is 100% of a company's corporate tax liability, by the way, and for providing incentive grants for job growth, tax exemptions to help with relocation, and so on. There are many others. COVID research in our state is also inspiring. I don't know of a time when there was such a focus and intensity in solving a medical problem. Indeed, the scientific advances are being made at hitherto unmatched speed. The cooperation among public, private, and academic entities is truly a model of what it should be. Virtually all the major pharma companies in the state, our research universities, medical schools, and associated institutes, and of course the very many companies, the biotechnology companies, are involved in COVID research, ranging from vaccines to antivirals to therapeutics to diagnostics. Clearly, New Jersey is a leading center for biopharma R&D, including COVID research. Next question. Why Israel for biotech and pharma? As Debbie indicated, through my association for a number of biotech ventures in Israel, the Israel Biotech Fund, from whom you'll be hearing later, my family's involvement with the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and with the Rambam Healthcare Center, and of course, Teva, I've come to know Israel's economic strength and amazing medical expertise. Indeed, the research and scientific structure that makes it a research powerhouse. However, while New Jersey's role in biopharma is legendary, there are some facts about Israel that many might not know. I'll give you a few of those. Number, it, Israel's number one worldwide in medical device patents per capita and number four for biopharma. It has the highest number of Nobel Prizes per capita. Israel has the highest concentration of engineers and PhDs per capita of any country. It's ranked second in the world by gross expenditures on R&D as a percent of GDP. It is in the top 10 worldwide in the number of patents in absolute numbers. The Global Innovation Index ranks Israel in the top 10 globally. It is ranked the world's fifth most innovative country by the Bloomberg Innovation Index. 
Only the US and China have more NASDAQ listed companies than Israel. There's one startup for every 1,200 people in Israel, which is an awesome number. I'm gonna stop there, but there are many others highlighting Israel's capability in science and technology and entrepreneurship. And COVID research in Israel is intense. For example, Jerusalem, which has evolved into an impressive center for scientific ventures, boasts a concentration of over 150 life science companies and is also home to the Hebrew University, where in the intensity of COVID research is exemplified by 60, 60 research teams working on finding a vaccine as well as better diagnostics and treatments. Indeed, throughout all Israel, there is an intense effort going on by hospitals, research institutions, and academic centers towards alleviating the pandemic. So, the strength of Israel bioscience and Jerusalem as a hub is world-class and is amazingly productive. Then the next question, why together? Why Israel and New Jersey? Well, Jerusalem, Israel, and New Jersey have very strong ties. For example, at the governmental level, Governor Murphy demonstrated his commitment to Jerusalem and Israel with a bilateral business collaboration that Jose mentioned that promotes partnerships between organizations in New Jersey and Jerusalem with a focus on the life science sector. The New Jersey Israel Commission was established in 1989 to among other things, promote the development of trade, capital investment and joint business ventures. Additionally, there have, been many numer there have been numerous New Jersey pharmaceutical companies that have participated in the U.S. Binational Industrial Research and Development Programs, also known as the BERT Program, which supports about 20 industrial R&D projects annually. The cumulative sales of products developed through BERT have exceeded $10 billion. The ties between the company I chair, Teva, the largest company in Israel, and New Jersey is strong. Teva employs 1,000 people in its New Jersey, North American headquarters. And again, thank you, Governor Murphy and his team for facilitating bringing our North America headquarters to New Jersey. Additionally, while Teva fills more than 1 million prescriptions per day in the US with a Teva product and contributes directly to the sustainability of the US healthcare system, the savings in New Jersey alone amount to over $1 billion annually. If you look at the facts, the match is great. We have complementary research programs, a significant intensity of research as part of our respective economic basis, the high concentrations of scientists and engineers, the importance of the life sciences to both, a hard driving culture in both New Jersey and in Israel, and entrepreneurial focus and governments that actively support the strong interaction. And if that isn't enough, we have a governor who understands this. Indeed, as mentioned, as was mentioned, his first trade mission was to Israel. And we have a mayor in Jerusalem, a major research hub who is so very supportive. The relationship is deep and successful and will grow. One of the remarkable things to see is the focus, effort, and cooperation on COVID research around the world. The opportunities and impact and health are staggering, not only for COVID, but also the mechanisms discovered, the drugs discovered, the biology discovered, the techniques, the equipment, and processes developed will also be significantly impactful on other diseases and conditions. So COVID research and cooperation transcends the immediacy of the situation. The opportunities abound. The New Jersey, Jerusalem, Israel match is ideal. It is proven. The opportunities are there. The governments are very supportive and the people eager to cooperate. Let us work together towards helping to solve the pandemic and then continue to progress from there. Thank you. Thank you, Saul. Um, actually, the deputy mayor has joined us, so we're going to go right ahead and turn it over to the deputy mayor, Sanaim, to 
to do some warm welcomes. I think you're on mute. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I think you're on mute right now. Yes, thank you. You'd think after two months I would have learned how to use Zoom. Um, <laughs> it's wonderful to be with all of you. Uh, it's always a, a fantastic, uh, fantastic thing when uh, partnerships are created between states and cities. Uh, we had a, fan a fantastically successful uh, banking partnership that we've uh, that we've launched that was born a few months ago here in our city, and we hope that th that was an omen to many more partnerships in the future. And of course, the biotech link is actually something quite amazing that we need to uh, strengthen every day. So Jerusalem uh, is constantly looking at what we can learn from the world and what we can teach. Um, and I think this COVID, uh, this terrible um, situation that we've been in has also made lots of different cities and states regroup and understand what is needed and who are the partners that can help us achieve what we need to achieve. And I think that what we have here is an opportunity coming from a, a tragedy. Uh, which is, uh, you know, a terrible situation. I understand it, and I know how much New Jersey has been hit by the COVID-19. Uh, and we in Jerusalem, of all the cities, uh, especially among certain populations, have also been affected. And we've learned our lessons from this. Um, and what we need to do now is figure out what it is, how it is, that we can strengthen each other. As was mentioned uh, by Saul Bera, we have a lot in common. We are also a very um, fertile biotech, we have a very fertile biotech ecosystem here in Jerusalem. We have a city company called the Jerusalem Development Authority that organizes together with you. My colleague Shai is also here. And our main purpose is to develop the bio ecosystem of Jerusalem and to find the partners where we can strengthen each other. So we have an ecosystem that was already there and already strong. We have the best university hospital in the country that does the research. We have engineering colleges where we have a lot of the biotech that's, uh, that's come up. We have um, design schools that are also uh, actually relevant in terms of biotechnology. And what we see in Jerusalem is that we have a lot of convergence of different contrasting things that can actually enrich. On top of that, the diversity of our city is always something that we, we always see as an opportunity rather than a challenge. And I think together with the things that we have in common, the diverse population of New Jersey, uh, the, 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 the niche that you've developed in biotech and in pharma, and of course, very much the desire uh, to create partnerships which are fruitful for both sides. We are thrilled that this, I hope, is only the beginning of a conversation that we will be able to reach out with our innovation, which is the strength in Israel. And you'll be able to bring us back the know-how and the knowledge and the expertise in building and managing big companies. And that's always a very fruitful partnership. And uh, the mayor has asked me to convey his apologies. Uh, an emergency situation, again, Corona related, uh, came up today. Um, he sends his apologies, but he's very, very much a patron of this partnership. Uh, and I'm one of his foot soldiers in anything that we need in order to create and make it even stronger. So I hope we have a uh, uh, a fruitful meeting and Jerusalem is waiting for you the day that uh, that we can all travel back. Well, thank you again and well wishes to you and the mayor and hopefully all is well and safe in Jerusalem and we absolutely look forward to the moment where we can actually jump back on a plane and come over and visit again. So we look forward. Thank you. All right, on that I'm going to bring it back to uh, Debbie Hart. Thanks so much, Jose, and thanks, Deputy Mayor, for being with us. It's amazing what's going on in Jerusalem, um, and we congratulate you on that. And, and again, thank you to Saul Bear, or Dr. Bear, who's, who's with us this morning. Appreciate your, your words um, and your perspective, given your dual, um, your dual role in New Jersey and Israel. 
Um, so I'm just going to spend a moment on uh, a little bit more about New Jersey, and I won't dive too deeply. You've heard some of it already, um, and hopefully you're, some, you're somewhat familiar. So New Jersey, uh, the life sciences industry in New Jersey has a dramatic, a tremendous economic impact at $47.5 billion. Um, many, many companies doing amazing things. We have a full continuum from, as we say, uh, the very largest of the lar large to the smallest of the small, a man or a woman in a molecule, as we say at BioNJ. Um, 430,000 direct and indirect jobs. Um, uh, uh, lots of work going on at the academic institutions. We do really do have an ecosystem where people are collaborating together. Uh, what I think one of the most extraordinary things that's going on right now is all the work in COVID. So there are more than 200 companies working on nearly 500 programs um, to address COVID-19. And I apologize, actually, that number is more like 500 companies now. Um, and many of them are in New Jersey. And we're so fortunate that you'll hear from several of them today. We thank all of you, our New Jersey companies, for being here with us. Um, next slide, please. And our mission at BioNJ is to make sure that New Jersey is a robust life sciences ecosystem, where there's lots of innovation going on and where patients can access that innovation. Um, for the for the uh, for to address their 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 diseases, um, and our vision at BioNJ is that all of the ecosystem is working together, and we're working on in various ways, whether it be policy or bringing people together to edu to educate and and have them network together um, to helping them find talent. And we're proud of the role that we play in New Jersey's ecosystem. It's our honor and our privilege to do that every day. I thank you all for being with us this morning and for giving us a little bit of time to share the bio and J story. And I wish us all well in the rest of the program and in our, in our current challenges. So thank you everyone. Jose, back to you. Thank you, Debbie, appreciate it. Uh, next we'd like to have Shai from uh, the CEO of Bio Jerusalem. Hi everyone, um, so I'm very happy to see so many people that are interested in the biotech that uh, Jerusalem and New Jersey has to offer. Uh, now, first of all, I want to thank uh, all the people behind this event, uh, my, uh, my uh, dear partners, first of all, of course, Andrew, Andrew Gross, my partner from the Israeli uh, New Jersey Commission, the Choose New Jersey, and of course, uh, the people at BioNJ. Now, BioJerusalem, um, our organization is a center run by the Jerusalem Development Authority, also with cooperation with the Jerusalem Municipality, uh, that is working for business development in the life science industry in Jerusalem. Now, for any of you who doesn't really know, Jerusalem today uh, is the center for life science in Israel with 154 companies we are leading in the center, in the, um, in the ecosystem in Israel, and of course also in, uh, we are partnering the global uh, arena. Uh, what is more interesting about Jerusalem is um, that it has a specific, a, a specific um, work on uh, pharmaceuticals that uh, has not been uh, mentioned in other uh, places. Now, several months ago, I met in Israel with Andrew and his team, and we really realized that um, New Jersey and Jerusalem has a lot in common. Um, we, and we understood how the cooperation between those two places could really help us get uh, achievements for both places. Now, from my point of view, this event is an opportunity, it's an opportunity for Jerusalem and New Jersey to tell our technological story, our advanced technological story, through uh, the activity of our leading companies sitting in, our, in Jerusalem and New Jersey working today on uh, the cutting edge uh, technology uh, breakthroughs to help us with the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, I would like to thank all of you, uh, the part, uh, all of the participants and the uh, people who are watching this uh, event and I really hope you will have a very uh, beneficial event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shai. Next, I'd like to turn over to Andrew Gross, our uh, Executive Director of the New Jersey Israel Commission. Jose, thank you so much. And of course, uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, this morning and afternoon for those in Israel. Uh, as was stated, I'm Andrew Gross. I'm the Executive Director of the New Jersey Israel Commission. 
which in case uh, you don't know, and it was, was mentioned before, it's a, it's a unique statewide office of the state of New Jersey uh, in charge of all the state's relations with the state of Israel. Um, I'm really proud to be with you, and I'm, I'm really uh, here to say, uh, and I think it's obvious that the relationship between New Jersey and Israel is absolutely uh, critical. It's one of the most uh, important international relationships of the state of New Jersey, uh, this office going back to 1989. We look at the, the importance in different ways, and one of them is, is economic. And uh, last uh, month, we were able to announce uh, that the value of the New Jersey-Israel relationship economically is actually about $1.3 billion in two-way trade. So we really see how conversations like this are contributing both to the economy of New Jersey, the economy uh, of Israel. So I'm so excited to uh, have been a part of, of planning this incredible program with incredible uh, speakers. Uh, it's really uh, an opportunity to showcase the strength and the promise of the New Jersey-Israel relationship and the future of that relationship, which is built in the competitive advantages of both locations. Uh, we really see, again, uh, through these incredible companies, uh, two global centers of, of the biotech industry that are being brought together to solve what I think we would all agree is probably the most pressing international problem we have today, COVID-19. So what better way to capitalize on this, on this wonderful relationship than to solve this problem together? So uh, as I conclude, I really want to thank especially our partners in Israel uh, who have joined us, particularly Ambassador Danny Dayan, who's, who's been an incredible friend uh, and leader supporting the New Jersey-Israel relationship, Eno and Elroy, who you'll, you'll hear from in a moment. Of course, the wonderful Deputy Mayor uh, who stepped in uh, at the last second this morning. We're so appreciative. And all of my friends uh, in New Jersey, uh, Debbie uh, and Mark, thank you. And of course, Shai for the incredible partnership with the city of Jerusalem. So uh, with that, Jose, uh, back to you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, next, it's uh, my deepest pleasure to introduce our Ambassador Danny Diane, who, uh, who is a great friend to not only New Jersey, but in, even though the consulate is housed in New York, uh, we know that deep down New Jersey is his favorite. So uh, I now I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Jose. Uh, great to be here. I will be brief uh, for two reasons. First of all, there are many speakers in this event. And the second and probably most important, after the uh, ex excellent pitch of Saul Bayer, my friend Dr. Saul Bayer, about Israel in general, and uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Hassan about Jerusalem in particular, I can only ruin it. So they did it so well that I, can, I only can cause damage if I continue. Um, so I really would like uh, to thank the organizers, uh, uh, Bio New Jersey, Bio Jerusalem, uh, the Israel uh, uh, New Jersey Commission, uh, my friends uh, Mark Levinson and Andrew Gross, and you, Jose, uh, and Choose New Jersey. We, we spent uh, uh, incredible quality time, uh, very fruitful together in Israel, and I think that what we see now is the continuation of that. But uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank a person that uh, understandably is not here with us. He has uh, many other headaches now uh, on his uh, agenda, and that is uh, Governor Phil Murphy. Uh, you know, I, f I work uh, with uh, five governors, with five administrations in this country, in the states I represent uh, Israel to. And uh, I think that the attitude uh, towards the state of Israel uh, uh, of Governor Murphy is unique uh, by far. Um, the friendship he displays uh, to our country and uh, the, the fact that he understands that the relation between his state and the state of Israel is strategic uh, uh, for his state and he also strategic for Israel. That was also uh, expressed in a, a very touching uh, phone call of uh, the president of the state of Israel, uh, President Rivlin, uh, with uh, uh, Governor Murphy uh, two, three weeks ago, uh, 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 and really we are so thankful to the, to the administration. In Hebrew, we say Ruach Hamfaket, the spirit of the chief, uh, of the captain, and that's a spirit that permits, uh, 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 trickles down, and uh, we see it uh, continuously, and we are extremely thankful. My last remark would be that one of the, uh, one of the uh, most uh, famous and important uh, uh, 
phrases in Judaism is Ki mitzion tetze Torah, from Zion, which is a, a, a synonym for Jerusalem. Zion is, is synonymous to Jerusalem. Uh, came the Torah, the law, the, the law of justice, etc., etc. This time we hope that uh, uh, thanks to the research that is being done in Jerusalem, mitzion tetze trufa, from, from Zion will come the cure, the cure for COVID-19. That is one of our challenges, and uh, obviously, as always, we will share it with the entire world. I know that as we speak, many, many scientists uh, in Israel are at the forefront of, of, the, of the effort to find the cure or a vaccine, and uh, uh, also this cooperation between Israeli research institutes and firms and New Jersey, top-notch institutes and firms, uh, is also a, an edge that we have in order to uh, accomplish that mission. Thank you so much to all of you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to turn over to uh, Inon Roy from the Economic Ministry and a good friend. Thank you, Jose. Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon to all the colleagues in Israel. Uh, uh, Ambassador Diana will follow with the uh, Ruach Hamfaked. And I think that you can uh, register a patent of, uh, in, in regarding to Mitzion Tetzet that's, uh, that's a very original <laughs> sentence. So I'm delighted to participate in this webinar and greeting to uh, New Jersey Israel Commission, choose uh, New Jersey, Bio NJ, and Bio uh, Jerusalem. It was a great pleasure for me, uh, or it is a great pleasure for me to work with uh, all, all, all of you partners in, in, in New Jersey. And I was delighted to work with you uh, and to accompany you uh, for the uh, visit that uh, you've been in Israel, as Jose said, uh, just uh, earlier this year. I was really uh, impressed by the commitment of the New Jersey leadership uh, to leverage, uh, furthermore, the excellent relations between our economies. Uh, as Dr. Breyer said, who's dealing with uh, bridging between life science uh, ventures in Israel, in US in general, uh, and, and in uh, between New Jersey specific, there's a lot going on and the potential is even uh, uh, larger. Uh, we're talking about a uh, bilateral trade of about uh, $1.3 billion and uh, uh, Israel or New Jersey is the fifth importer from Israel. Uh, Israel is uh, the sixth uh, exporter to uh, New Jersey and uh, we saw also uh, an increase of the trade between the states uh, in 2019. Uh, by the way, as you heard, uh, Teva alone employ about 1,000 em uh, employees in New Jersey, and there's so many uh, other companies working uh, in New Jersey. Take into the consideration that about 64% of the Greenfield uh, FDI from Israel to New Jersey it's only in uh, pharmaceutics. So uh, uh, the potential is, uh, is really huge. At this point, I think that it will be also uh, make sense to remind all of us about a very important platform which could serve you to decrease the risk of working together. And I'm talking between uh, New Jersey and Israeli companies. If you guys want to work together, so remember uh, the US government and the Israeli government launched uh, a fund. We have fund, I think, uh, talked about it. It's the Bird Foundation, which offers up to $1 million to wear joint technology development between U.S. and Israeli companies. I encourage New Jersey companies to take advantage of it, and Israelis, of course. There have been 71 such projects funded with New Jersey companies over the years, 18 of them relating to life science and healthcare IT. So there is a call uh, for proposal out. You can contact us, you can contact uh, the commission, you can contact uh, Andrea Iona, who's the representative of BIRD, and she's a resident of uh, uh, New Jersey in order to uh, learn more about it. Lastly, we're very happy and uh, grateful for the partnership with the New Jersey Israel Commission and with Choose, and we invite all of you uh, to approach us. We work very closely with, uh, with the Commission and with Choose. If you guys are seeking for partners to develop your business and to strengthening our economic and technological bonds, you feel free to approach also the Israel Economic Mission here. Thank you so much and uh, good luck with this webinar. Thank you, Inon. I really appreciate it. Now I'd like to turn it over to um, Ido uh, with the Israel Biotech Fund. For a couple minutes. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity to present to you. 
I would like to begin by sharing some thoughts regarding the thriving Israeli biotechnology industry and the reason we believe that Israel is going to be the next great global biotechnology hub. As you can see on the graph, the pipeline of products candidates from preclinical stage to phase three in Israel is similar to the pipeline in Germany and Switzerland. The difference is that in Germany, these opportunities are mainly developed by large pharma companies like Merck, Serono, and Bayer, and in Switzerland by Roche and Novartis. In Israel, these opportunities emerge from small companies, each uh, developing one or two products which make them financially approachable for investors. The pipeline in Israel is growing and there are about 150 new life science companies every year, out of which 20 to 25 of them uh, are new biopharma companies. The potential in Israel for the establishment of a large biopharmaceutical presence is significant. Drugs and platforms that were initially developed by Israelis but was sold or licensed uh, at an early stage to large global pharma companies currently generate over $100 billion of revenues annually. This great potential is what led my partners, uh, Dr. David Sdransky and Dr. Yuval Kabili and me to start our fund. The Israel Biotech Fund or IBF is a fundamental VC focusing on Israeli biotechnology companies. Our goal is to generate significant return to our investors uh, by building su sustainable uh, biopharma company. Uh, helping us with this mission are Celgin and Biogen, who joined as the strategic partners, and two Israel's largest pension fund, Harel and Menorah, to become our main investors, along with the number of international institutions and, and companies. The market and regulations for medicines are based mainly in the, in the US. One of the main challenges in Israel is to find management with the necessary pharmaceutical experience, with regulatory expertise, strategic and perspectives and planning, and access to financial institutions in the US. While success in the biotechnology and pharmaceuticals industries can be incredibly rewarding, we, both uh, in human and financial terms, the regulatory path is long and expensive. The scientific risk is significant and the operational aspects are daunting. Hence, it is critical for new management to have mentors and board members with the right experience to guide them. The IBF strategy for this and the key differentiator from other funds uh, is the active involvement of our, of our venture advisory team a team comprised of more than 30 industry leaders and professionals, including uh, Dr. Saul Barrer, who spoke earlier, Jeff, Ken Jeff Kindler, former CEO of Pfizer, uh, Dr. David Shulkin, former State Secretary of the VA, and other top tier C-level executives, as well as senior healthcare and financial uh, professionals. Our venture advisors are active participants in the fund in several ways. They participate in meetings in which we assess each potential portfolio company in details. The entrepreneurs travel from Israel to New Jersey to present to our team for an intense three, four hours interactive session. The advisors will often participate in the due diligence review, review of potential portfolio companies. And a number of them uh, serve as board members or advisors of uh, our portfolio companies. In the last five years, uh, out of the 300 companies that we met, 20 companies presented in the US to our venture advisors, out of which the fund invested in eight. I'm proud to say that in this challenging economic environment, our flagship portfolio company, which was formed by IBF, Ayala Pharmaceuticals, had a successful IPO about two weeks ago. And several days later, a, another portfolio company, Gamida Cell, reported a successful pivotal uh, clinical trial. We, we recently started the second fund, IBF2 was formed last year, and we are in the midst of fundraising. Uh, we have already invested in two companies, an early stage cystic fibrosis company and a phase two oncology company. Uh, to conclude, we are excited to be part of growing industry in Israel, focus on helping entrepreneurs develop new therapeutics for patients, helping to continue to build the Israeli biotech ecosystem and build successful company. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today.
Thank you, Edom. Very much appreciate that. Okay, now we're going to go through a uh, uh, a little bit of a round robin with a bunch of uh, with a couple of companies that are doing some really great innovative stuff on COVID. And want to give a little overview. They'll have only about three minutes uh, to go through because we want to definitely allow enough time for a good Q and A session at the very end. So the first one to kick it off, uh, Will Lewis, uh, with Inspect. Thank you, Choose New Jersey, the New Jersey Israeli Commission, Bio Jerusalem, Bio NJ, the Deputy Mayor, Mr. Ambassador, and of course, Dr. Silbera for inviting me to join this event. As we've already heard this morning, the state of New Jersey and the state of Israel share a deep commitment to advancing life sciences research with deep capabilities, and as Dr. Bearer and others have highlighted, already a rich history focused on tackling some of the world's most pressing medical challenges. Our shared leadership has never been more critical than right now as we come together as a global life sciences community in the fight against COVID-19. And I wanna to pause to just say, I think perhaps the thing that we both share more than any other is the sense of empathy and the deep need. There are people who are suffering right now. And as it happens, New Jersey is at the heartland of this uh, global pandemic in many ways. Um, Israel has this same kind of empathy for all kinds of reasons. And so I think the bridges that exist right now um, are ones that we need to cross with greater frequency and intensity as we fight this global pandemic. Let me give you a brief glimpse in, into Insmed. We're a global biopharmaceutical company, a commercial uh, organization headquartered in Bridgewater, New Jersey. We're on a mission to transform the lives of patients with serious and rare diseases. Our leading commercial product, Aracase, is approved in the U.S. and now I'm proud to say available in Israel through our partner, TrueMed. Our focus to date has primarily been on pulmonary and inflammatory diseases that have few, if any, treatments available for them. Since our time is limited, I'm going to jump right into our pipeline candidate, which is called Brensocatib and what we call the Stop COVID-19 Study. Brensocatib is a novel oral reversible inhibitor of dipeptidyl peptidase, or DPP-1, that we're currently developing for the treatment of bronchiectasis. DPP-1 is an enzyme that catalyzes the activation of NSPs, or neutrophil serine proteases, when they are formed in the bone marrow. By inhibiting, by inhibiting the activation of NSPs, our hope is that Brensicathib may be able to address a broad range of neutrophil-mediated diseases. Uh, Professor uh, James Chalmers, who was the principal investigator of a very successful phase two study in bronchiectasis, hypothesized that by blocking these NSPs, Brensicathib could potentially reduce the risk of progression of COVID-19 patients to ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. So we are currently running a 300 patient study across 10 centers in the United Kingdom, which is designed to determine whether our drug once a day for 28 days will be able to derail patients from progressing into this serious condition that is life-threatening called ARDS. And we should have uh, early information about that in August and complete data in this study by the end of the year. So with that, I'm happy to address any questions later on. And I'd like to thank you again for letting me be a part of this discussion. Great, thank you, Will. Next, we'd like to turn it over to uh, Kai Grief from uh, Cell Agnostics. Thank you, Jose. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, I'm Guy Grief, uh, uh, one of the co-founders uh, and deputy CEO of, of uh, at Cell Agnostics. Cell Agnostics is a spin-off company from the Ibrio University and focus uh, on saliva diagnostic solution for rapid diagnostic tests. I guess you're all familiar with the OM pregnancy test. So this is the platform which is used for a variety of uh, different uh, applications. Uh, our technologies actually qualify saliva, which is uh, very um, rich in uh, analytes uh, to use uh, to be used by this platform uh, our technologies are a platform so it can easily uh, uh, be adapted to any to any uh, um, uh, physiological uh, uh, condition and our uh, most known product is the saliva uh, uh, pregnancy test, uh, which you can uh, also see in the screen. So uh, following uh, the 
outbreak of uh, COVID-19. We also joined the global uh, effort uh, and uh, started the development of uh, uh, um, saliva-based test uh, for COVID-19, which can be used uh, by, it is, it is a self-use uh, product. Uh, and can allow a uh, large scale uh, population screen uh, in the community. Such a uh, product is uh, composed of three components, as you can see device, which collects and streams uh, the, the fluids, uh, saliva, we call it a toolbox treatment which transforms saliva from non-detectable to detectable uh, body fluid upon this assay. And of course, the strip itself, uh, which uh, analyze the, the uh, result, provide the result. The combination of these three uh, components actually give us a, a working uh, product. So as you can see, the device and the, the technologies are already uh, exist. And these days we focus on development of three kinds of lateral flow immunoassay. One for, uh, we call it uh, um, against the uh, antigen to detect uh, the uh, antigen uh, itself. And the other based on commercial strip to detect uh, immunological uh, uh, agents. Uh, how can I? Oh, okay. So here you can see uh, results from uh, clinical trials we conducted against S protein and N protein of the uh, of the uh, antigen. All of the samples are uh, saliva taken from uh, healthy and positive diagnosed patients. You can see that we can detect very clearly in 2.5 nanogram per ml, uh, both S protein and N protein uh, in our device, which basically look like this. I don't know if you can see it. So the patients take the collection handle, put it a few uh, seconds in the mouth, just screw it over, and that's it. You can get the results after about 10 minutes. Uh, these results uh, are preliminary, and uh, these days we work both with Rambam and uh, uh, Wolfson, Wolfson Medical Center uh, to expand uh, the testing, but I think uh, as you can see, uh, these <coughs> preliminary results are, uh, show good differentiation between negative and positive and provide us a good back, good uh, uh, feeling about the feasibility of this uh, development. So that's it pretty much. We'll be happy to answer any question. Great. Thank you, Guy. I appreciate that. Uh, now we'd like to turn it over to Dan O'Connor with uh, Oncosec Medical. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks for uh, including us uh, in this morning's event. We really appreciate it. Special thanks to Choose New Jersey, the New Jersey Israeli Commission, Bio Jerusalem, Bio NJ, uh, especially Dr. Uh, Barra for his informative speech. Uh, Oncosex is a cancer immunotherapy company. We're using intratumoral IL-12. We put IL-12 on DNA plasmids and inject that directly into tumors. We've seen efficacy with our lead product candidate we call TABO, uh, both as a monotherapy and in combination with anti-PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors. As a monotherapy, we see a scopal effect uh, in combination with checkpoint inhibitors, in particular Merckx-Key Trudup, we've seen the ability to transform the biology of the tumor microenvironment from so-called cold to hot, taking patients who previously felt um, either Keytruda or Abdevo definitively and turning them into checkpoint responders. So we've got a clinical pipeline um, that's been under development for about a decade, uh, culminating into the events uh, this year, which is a pivotal 
phase two study, single arm study that's evaluating TAVO, plus Keytruda and checkpoint failures uh, in late stage metastatic melanoma. Partnerships with Merck, um, Surtax, and others of, of, of which we're very appreciative. Next slide, please. The, um, the program uh, that we're um, supporting really is, I think, a testament to the collaboration that many have spoken about um, so far this morning. Uh, in particular, when the coronavirus occurred in January, uh, the company asks itself or asked itself, how can we use IL-12, our, again, our intratumoral DNA uh, approach to, potential, to potentially enhance a vaccine approach? Um, and, and in that way, we um, asked our researchers to look at that question. They came back quickly with a response that they thought that IL-12 actually could be used as an as a, um, enhancement, if you will, to a um, potential uh, coronavirus vaccine. Uh, we distilled that, um, that analysis to um, a white paper and shared that with the researchers at NIH. And the researchers at NIH came back quickly to the company and said, they thought the idea had, uh, the concept had uh, a lot of merit and that it should be explored and they'd be willing to explore it with us or help us in exploring it. To that end, they licensed to the company non-exclusively their glycoprotein, their the so-called S protein or spike protein, um, which is now in clinic um, being used by Moderna, not as a DNA vaccine, but instead an RNA vaccine. We then shared the same concept with the cancer researchers of Providence Health. Uh, and they, again, um, similar to NIH, thought the, the idea had a lot of merit. Um, as cancer researchers, they're very familiar with cytokines, in particular IL-12, um, and they were very much interested in pursuing a clinical study um, to uh, explore whether or not what we now call Corvax-12, again, this is the combination of NIH's spike protein and r tavo or intertumoral IL-12, as a DNA vaccine approach. So Providence is currently um, looking or seeking to, to conduct a small phase one study, a 40-patient uh, study, looking at uh, the DNA vaccine as um, the spike protein uh, at one arm of the study with 20 patients, and then TAVO, um, again, our intratermal IL-12 plus the spike protein in the other arm for 20 patients. Um, they filed an investigator-initiated IND. They're sponsoring the study themselves. Um, and that process of seeking uh, FDA clearance to start the IND work or the phase one uh, work is underway. So again, I very much appreciate being included uh, in this morning's presentation and looking forward to the questions later on. Thank you very much. Hey, great, thank you. Next, I'd like to have uh, Gil Malworth from EDAS Healthcare. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for the opportunity and there is a lot of uh, people and organization to thank um, by Jerusalem Bio and J, Choose and J, and everyone here. EDAS is an early stage company, but has a very deep technology that allows remote and instant detection of respiratory infectious disease, adding now the coronavirus to the list of our pathogens. Next slide, please. So really, COVID-19 came as a surprise to all of us, but it's yet another respiratory infectious disease which carries very similar symptoms to all uh, other and flu-like diseases, which makes it very hard to diagnose. We all know about the uh, scarce number of tests and medical resources in order to, to diagnose and really screen populations. And the access becomes an issue uh, to medical teams uh, getting into patients, uh, being very uh, scared of being infected. One of the main keys of getting economies back to the new normal is the ability to screen mass population very fast. This is one of the biggest challenges that uh, uh, we're looking at right now. Whereas people still get sick with standard flu or other respiratory infectious disease. So it is very hard to distinguish. Next slide, please. So ERAS Healthcare has its engine based on AI and machine learning that allows for lab-grade AI detection of respiratory infectious disease. We now follow and detect 
14 different pathogens, and we're now adding the COVID-19 as our 15th standard pathogen. And the only way, the only thing you need in order to be diagnosed is to provide your age, gender, and address, and within a second, you would know whether you're uh, infected or not. When I say infected or not, we eliminate infection with 97%, at least 97% accuracy. And when we um, predict infection, it's around the 80%. Now physicians today, our research shows they are about 50% accuracy in their uh, primary care diagnosis and they need to send tests which take 24 to 48 hours and this is maybe the most critical time for treatment. Our engine is based on three pillars, very deep understanding of uh, the virology, very deep understanding of epidemiologic and uh, the right modeling and not less importantly the demographic modeling out of which we create a tribal knowledge database so that the next patient comes in, we can diagnose him by or provide the information to the physician only by his age, gender, and address. Our system was clinically validated at the Hadassah Medical Center in Jerusalem for the past 18 months with over, it's actually closer to 50,000 patients now. And uh, the results of our work have been publicated in uh, uh, quite uh, respectable publications. And the company has already received and granted a US patent for its technology. The uniqueness of what we do is that we're able to provide lab level accuracy for the specific pathogens in seconds to the full set of respiratory infectious disease without any equipment and from remote. We all know that telemedicine today is becoming a mainstream issue and a mainstream vehicle to treat and diagnose um, amid the coronavirus and we are there to help. Next slide please. If we're looking at the impact on the COVID battle, so even now we can increase the test positive ratio of the COVID tests by eliminating other infections. So even before concluding our COVID-19 addition, we can already increase the efficiency of the medical resources. We can identify areas with infected population and so on and so forth. But more importantly, on the day after, our focus to help economies to get back to the new normal by the ability to screen mass populations in seconds. Let me give you just an example. Australia and New Zealand are now creating a capsule that would allow uh, residents from both countries to travel between those countries, provided they get tested. How would you do that? So we're proposing our solution to help diagnosing and, or help screening uh, for uh, eliminating infections on the spot. Employers that want uh, to go back to work and need to uh, be screened on a daily basis or a few times a day, this is something that our solution can be used for. And on the new normal, the COVID-19 will be one of our 15 pathogens that we already oh, Jose, I think we're losing Dan. Perhaps we move on to the next. Did we, okay, did we lose him? I'm here. Oh, okay, Gil, uh, Gil could you? Could you just wrap it right up as we're going to go right at, we have to keep up. Yes. So I thank you all for the opportunity and uh, we, I wish all of us good health. Thank you, Gail. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we'll turn over to uh, Susan Levison uh, from our Biologist uh, Therapeutics. Right. Good morning and good afternoon. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me here today. I'm here today to share how recombinant human plasma gel solid is expected to address the COVID-19 crisis, but BioEgis is about more than COVID-19. Our mission is to address medical issues previously thought to be out of reach. That is to prevent the damage caused by excess inflammation without suppressing the immune system. We expect our approach will save lives 
as well as reduce the morbidity of chronic disease. Our passionate leadership team has over 60 years of pharmaceutical experience, and we're developing technology licensed from Harvard University hospitals. Recombinant Jocelyn is expected to be a life-saving prevention of organ failure in COVID-19, as well as other severe pneumonias, whether they're from bacterial or viral infection. It's a key component of our immune system, regulates inflammation, and fights infection. Next slide, please. So why are we so confident that recombinant gelsalin can save COVID-19 patients? Gelsalin is a normal protein circulating in our blood at high levels and a master regulator of inflammation. It boosts the ability of macrophages to take up and kill bacteria of all the types we have tested. It promotes the resolution of excess inflammation and protects organs, especially the lungs. But this protein becomes severely depleted in inflammation, injury, and infection, including COVID-19 patients who have already been studied at NIH. Patients with comorbidities would have depressed levels even before infection. Supplementation is expected to prevent or reduce the cytokine storm in patients with co severe COVID-19. Organ protection and improved survival has already been demonstrated in more than 20 animal models of diverse diseases, including models of the cytokine storm. So what's next? We are excited to share that we expect to initiate our randomized placebo-controlled double-blind phase two study in severe COVID-19 patients this month. This study follows a phase 1b2a study, which was completed last year in hospitalized pneumonia patients, which reported no safety signals, even at doses of gelsalin that raise levels well above normal. While many companies are pursuing antivirals and vaccines for this pandemic, there are few that are addressing the severe cytokine storm that are not also immunosuppressive. Recombinant human plasma gelsalin has the unique property that it is not pathogen specific and thus will be a solution, not just for COVID-19, but for future threats, which emerge as well. Thank you for your attention and your interest. Um, please visit our website and follow us as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. All right, and our last speaker before we go into a Q&A, um, Amit Makali from uh, Pepticum. Thank you very much. So uh, just to get a vision of what peptides are, they're uh, combinations or uh, polymers of amino acids. And what makes them special and a big problem is the chemical space. We can have over 10 to the power of 30 different peptides. And that means that we probably have a solution for COVID-19 in that set. The problem is finding that solution. And it's a very, very large chemical uh, space to search through. And in fact, the best screening techniques in the lab today only cover about 10 to the power of 12 molecules, and that's the top-notch technologies. But you're not gonna find the answer out of 10 to the power of 30 if you only look at 10 to the power of 12. Your probability is pretty low. So what Pepticon developed is basically an artificial intelligence reinforcement learning virtual screening system for finding these peptides virtually in a, a faster, cheaper, and more robust way. Today, our software covers over 100 different monomer types, amino acid types, and multiple cyclization modes covering an unprecedented chemical space. So this is a very uh, strong search engine uh, for the peptide chemical space, which may help us find a drug for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So when we talk about uh, our main advantage is uh, peptides are generally larger than small molecules they can compete with monoclonal antibodies as drugs, and they can actually target flat protein-protein interfaces. And the one that's, of course, critical for COVID-19 is the spike on the uh, viral uh, envelope versus the human ACE2, which is what makes it really recognize human cells. So if theoretically this uh, interaction would be blocked, the COVID-19 could not infect human cells. Uh, and so, we decided uh, to design peptides that could block this interaction. Next, please. So there's two different strategies, and let's see if we can get the movie on the left working too. One is we can design uh, on the left peptides that bind the spike 
protein in the place of its interface with uh, ACE2 in green, or alternately, we can uh, bind ACE2, the human protein, in the area where it binds the viral spike. So there's two different strategies. We can go along with this, and we did. We went for both strategies. Next slide, please. And the current situation is uh, for spike blockers, 17 peptides were synthesized, 15 were already screened uh, using uh, MST for binding. So we have binding coefficients for them. And four peptides have hit level KDs. That means they're uh, in the one micromolar range. Um, so these peptides bind uh, the spike protein. And next, please. Uh, when we went for ACE2 so far, five peptides were synthesized, all were screened using MSTs, and two of them have hit level KDs. So we basically have binders right now for both ACE2 and uh, spike, hopefully in the area which will inhibit their interaction together. Next slide, please. So just a quick timeline of what went through. So we're a small company, a young company, um, just went through round A several months ago. Uh, by uh, early March, we decided that we need to join in on COVID-19, uh, but this is out of our budget, which is very focused on our own molecules. Um, so we seeked another partner. And uh, in the meanwhile, while we're seeking this other partner, we already uh, initiated software search. By April, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world uh, decided to sponsor this project. So they paid for everything thus far. And uh, we had an output that we had synthesized by May, we already had synthesized peptides and binding level screening hits validated. So we know we're already binding this protein with our peptides. It's important to say these are brand new peptides, non-natural macrocycles. They're not derivatives of any known protein. Completely searched through this virtual uh, molecular Google. And by June, we hope to get more functional assays done and uh, going from starting the hit to lead process. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Now we're going to turn it over to Mark. I know we're a few minutes behind, but I know Mark will find a way to see this guy <laughs> on the Q and A there. Mark, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jose. What a terrific group of panelists and participants. We also thank all the uh, speakers who led into the panelists. It's a terrific, terrific example of the cooperation between New Jersey and Israel. And hopefully these two great countries and states can help us lead the, the way and the path forward. So we had a tremendous group of uh, presenters today. Uh, Insamed Will Lewis on Brensocative and how that helps uh, treat COVID-19. Cell Agnostics with Gary Kreef, the rapid self-test cell uh, saliva uh, diagnostic test uh, on Oncosac with Dan O'Connor on how to help implement the Corvix-12 vaccine. Uh, Gil Medworth from uh, Edis Healthcare and this incredible mass remote and instant detection and screening in seconds. Um, Susan Levinson, no relation, from BioAgis Therapeutics, using recombinant gelsalin to help save COVID-19 patents, patients and patents, and Pepticon, uh, and Amit Michali, using I, I, AI software to help screen peptides and to help block and interfere with harmful interactions. This is so much us lame and a little bit difficult to understand. If I could talk, uh, ask each of the panelists, we have Q's, uh, Q and A's, uh, lined up there. If I could ask each of the panelists in order of your presentation to take one minute to just talk about how you see working together with other partners to help achieve results. At a big picture, everyone somehow thinks we need to get to a vaccine. But when we listen to these presentations, we understand there are several steps, each of which could help interfere, slow, the, slow this horrific disease, and also help lead us to a cure. So let's start off with Will, one minute, talk about how you co could cooperate with others on this panel, as well as others out there in the field. One minute. Well, thank you very much for the uh, question, Mark. I have to say, I've got two names already written down here, um, which uh, relate not only, and this is one of the great things about a, a forum like this, we're working on COVID-19, others are as well, but I heard about technologies for screening pulmonary infections and indications that's instant, and I, and I know Susan's work um, as well, and I think as a company that's focused in the pulmonary arena, we start with COVID-19, that's the priority at the moment, but there's an opportunity here to think about this as a stepping stone for picking up on this notion of building bridges between New Jersey and Israel and companies that are in uh, both locations. And I heard uh, uh, several opportunities here, which I may be following up on 
Um, specifically for COVID-19, you know, as soon as we have the data, uh, our objective uh, was to get in this fight alongside everyone else. And I think that's one thing that we all share here is this passion and empathy to try to make a difference. So uh, our, our walls are down. We want people to uh, lock arms to find the right answer here as quickly as possible. Um, our drug is designed not to eradicate the virus, but to lessen the impact of it, not just now, but for those who've been infected and may um, have difficulties for years to come. And we look forward to working with uh, anyone else um, on, on that path. And, uh, Thank you, and Will. Thank you. Gary. That we're on, on point. Thank you, Will. Gary? Yes, it's, it's Guy. Uh, first, uh, I, I agree. I think that uh, cooperation uh, is always uh, elaborating. Uh, it's a win-win uh, situation. I think that uh, mostly at our stage, uh, the R&D uh, is way about uh, clinical experiments. Uh, I think that uh, both samples collection and uh, examining our uh, devices, our products among uh, a positive diagnosed population is something that uh, well can be very helpful in the uh, process of uh, bring this, bringing this product to, to the show. Thank you. Dan? Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, I would, I would probably just echo uh, what was um, said uh, by both Will and Guy. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, in the, the, it's the moment in time for us to collaborate and to look at each other's technologies and say, how can we work together? Um, you know, in our case, uh, we were extremely fortunate that the collaboration extended um, to the third largest hospital network in the United States, Providence Health, who um, was, you know, one of the, I think the first place where the outbreak occurred in Portland. Um, and we're on the very front lines um, and came to the company and said, um, we will uh, fund the study. And so, you know, our core focus is cancer immunotherapy. Um, but I think as many as, as many have um, others have done, we've asked ourselves, how can our specific technology be applied to um, help? You know, wills come with a treatment. We're looking to come forward with a vaccine. Um, I think I'm just grateful that NIH and Providence Health uh, really saw um, the same thing our cancer researchers saw, which was um, how you can take the learnings from cancer research and apply it to infectious disease. And I guess that's to your other part of your question mark, which is, you know, it's not only just the individuals that are um, running companies or leading uh, research efforts, it's fields of medicine that need to come together. You know, our field is cancer immunotherapy. Thanks. Thank you. Gil? Gil, you with us? Unmute, please. Let's go on to Susan and then we'll come back to Gil. Sure. So, Bayoui just has been establishing collaborations all over the world. We have more than 20 different institutions that we've collaborated with in the past, as well as with NIAID and the NIH Clinical Center. And I think it would be fabulous if all the companies that participated today were intended to continue to have conversations outside this conference and explore in more depth the possibilities to create more collaboration both within New Jersey and between New Jersey and Israel. So thank you, Susan. Thank, thank you, Susan. everyone. For Amit? Yeah, so our story is also the story of collaboration. I mean, and this shows how the world community, I mean, we had the last epidemic over 100 years ago, but this time the world's community hit it together. We had the solved PDB structures, which allow us to use our search algorithm within months of the outbreak. We had a large pharmaceutical company uh, sponsor everything uh, within a month after we put it out there. And we're very open to collaborate with anybody in New Jersey or anywhere else uh, to help fight this uh, epidemic. And we think that actually the, the, the way the world is behaving today, which is a lot of collaborations, will make this epidemic shorter than previous ones had been. Thank you. Gil, are you with us? 
Yes, I am, and I apologize for the technical okay. issues that I'm experiencing here. I don't know why, but uh, thank you uh, again. And I believe that as opposed to a lot of uh, uh, great uh, strategies that we heard, um, the way for us to really help um, through partnerships is not only with the leading uh, medical centers and uh, regional labs in New Jersey, but also, and here it's not exactly on the panelist side, but on the, on the guest side, um, from the New Jersey government would be an ideal partner for us in order to um, test drive our solution uh, statewide. This would allow the, uh, uh, the state of New Jersey as a, as a, uh, a leader in uh, biotech and healthcare to, um, to really uh, uh, show the impact of the ability to screen mass populations in second for COVID-19. So this you. is where I believe... Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, thank Gil. You. Thank you. So we, we have, we're, we're running into some time challenges here. What I'd like to do is just to mention a couple of things. First of all, uh, Inone Roy from the Economic Commission, great partner for many years with us at, Choo at New Jersey Judicial Commission and Choose New Jersey. He again points out, as he said, people should consider taking advantage of the bird funding of up to $1 million toward technology development between New Jersey and Israel, Israeli companies. A number of folks have asked if the slides will be available uh, after this program, we'll figure out a way to get everyone the slides. You can have your own uh, separate offline uh, discussions and interactions. We also have a significant number of one-off questions to specific companies. We're not going to be able to get to those. We'll, we, uh, the, the panelists are all, all seeing those and you'll, you'll hear directly back from them. I'd just like to do uh, one 30 to 45 second uh, final question that will go back. We'll start with Amit and work our way back upwards again. Just uh, what, what would you look from us in 30 to 45 seconds from New Jersey? It was actually just mentioned by Gil, so we'll, we'll incorporate his thoughts in here. The other, the other panelists, starting with Amit, what would you look from the people you're, you're speaking to at the New Jersey state level here? How can we try to help you? How can the Saul Bears and the, and the Debbie Hearts and others try to help you as you expand and, and, and forward your incredible products that we've all heard about today? Amit. So our technology is applicable to multiple targets. So basically just connecting to New Jersey companies that want to research other targets. There are intracellular targets that we looked at but weren't interested in from the get-go, maybe a company that's interested in some of those. We have immune modulator companies like uh, Will was talking about. Um, sorry if I'm not mistaken. And um, that's something we've also worked in. Uh, we've published papers about immune modulators that came out of the system. So just basically connecting to more people seeking solutions when they have the target all set for them. Great, thank you. Susan? I guess I think that <laughs> the most useful thing would be to continue to build the infrastructure of our community here in New Jersey and the bridges <laughs> as well. Thank you. Gil, do you want to add 30 seconds to what you said before? I know you did have some good questions and reach outs there. Anything else you'd like to hear or, or think to be uh, uh, input from New Jersey state officials them choose New Jersey? I believe uh, I, I did cover uh, in my previous comment. I'll save the time for others. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess this, as we progress the program, it's a, it's a phase one study with 40 patients. We're looking to get into clinic um, as soon as we, as Pro Providence is looking to get in clinic at their uh, facility in Portland. I think with success, we'd like to bring that um, into other locations and New Jersey and Israel in particular, I think would be great places, as well as preclinical research, which is something that's ongoing right now. We could use support with that. Thank you. Thank you. Guy. No, just um, as I mentioned, our most effort here is to get uh, samples and to test uh, our device, our uh, test in uh, uh, patients. So that's our main concern right now. Okay, Will, we're going to let you have the last word on this. I'll just say it's the ecosystem. And if we uh, take the heed the words that the ambassador said earlier, uh, we have no greater champion in New Jersey than the current Governor Murphy for which we're very grateful. 
And I think what we've heard today is that there is an equal amount of conviction and support in Israel and these bridges that are being built that uh, Saul so eloquently expressed at the start of this uh, event, I think highlight the way in which we can look to, uh, to lock arms and, and go after this. We were ready for this pandemic because of those ecosystem investments and commitments. And that's the thing that we should all remember and take away. Okay, well, we know there are tremendous opportunities for research and collaboration and cooperation with New Jersey. Uh, you've got a lot of the top talent on this line. Reach out to any one of us. And, uh, you know, this has been such a terrific panel. Uh, we're hopeful that this uh, vaccine will, will come under control, that we'll all be able to get together in, in relatively short order, whatever short order means. And I'm going to suggest to uh, Choose New Jersey, our partners, uh, the consulate, BioNJ, uh, and us from the New Jersey uh, Israel Commission, Andrew Gross and myself, we're going to want to recreate this panel and this group in the fall. Hopefully, when we're all back together, we'll do a live uh, program and presentation uh, you know, in New Jersey, and we're hopeful that there's going to be so many great results looking in the rearview mirror from the fall when we meet to talk about how we've achieved some real significant successes. So really, on behalf of uh, everyone here, on behalf of Saul Baer, Jose Lozano, uh, our great friend, Ambassador Danny Dayan, uh, Deputy Mayor Flor Hassan uh, Nahum, and uh, New Jersey Israel Commission, and uh, Debbie Hart, and everyone else, we want to thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we all have terrific partners there. Uh, New Jersey Israel Commission, Choose New Jersey, BioNJ, and we're there to help the governor, the front office, New Jersey. We want to help make the New Jersey Israel relationship and this fight in COVID-19 another tremendous success story. So I want to wish everyone a great day. And again, we'll look to do this, recreate this uh, in the fall. We'll get the slides out to you. Any individual questions that weren't answered, we'll get back to you. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day.